Good morning and welcome to Jew in the City Speaks with your host, Allison Josephs, also known as Jew in the City. The exciting thing about this podcast is that we get a chance to talk to regular people, um, but they're regular people that most people never get to hear from um, because they're regular Orthodox Jewish people. If you look at traditional media, most of the depictions of the Orthodox community are negative, and most of the depictions of the Orthodox community are Hasidic. Um, and while as someone from the modern Orthodox community, I feel frustrated that I never get to see representation of someone like me from my background, because really the only two uh, sort of flavors you have with Jews are secular or Hasidic, nothing in between. Um, I think that there is an especial frustration from the Hasidic community um, being represented over and over again, and always without depth, always with, um, you know, being very extreme, never being insightful. And so I think it's so important for us to highlight people here who are insightful, who have wisdom, um, who are thinking about important issues, who are working on important changes, um, who are people with voices, women with voices, because we you know, never get to see women with voices uh, in media if they're Hasidic. Um, and so I'm very excited to introduce you today, a woman named Geli Asafki. Um, she's a therapist. She's a Hasidic Jewish woman. Um, and I met her through another one of the women that we interviewed here. And it's just um, so nice to continue to expand our network and feature, you know, more women from this community. So Geli, thank you so much for joining us. Absolutely. Excited to be here and chat. So, okay, so start us off. Um, what's your Jewish background? Where did you grow up? How did you grow up? Okay, um, I'm a born and bred Muncie person, Muncie, New York. <laughs> Made Muncie. <famous laughs> exactly. By uh, Julia Hart. So, um, of the, my unorthodox life. So, I'm actually the third of 12 kids. Uh, my father is a Dayan, he's a Jewish judge. He spent his life learning and studying Torah. My mother had a little business and was a teacher when we were young. Then she stopped working to raise us. And I just grew up in a family and neighborhood surrounded by community. And um, I was just, I think, an ideal place to grow up in uh, the middle of the suburbs. And it was a very safe place to grow up. We spent the afternoons wandering around in the forest, playing ball, playing with dolls. I loved to read as a kid and um, just living normal life. So and that what was basically my childhood. And what was there a particular uh, Hasidic sect or Hasidus is how you say it in case you want to know the language. Sure, you don't say Hasidic sure. sect, you say Hasidus. Yep. <laughs> so I think my background is typical of many people in Muncie. Uh, my mother actually comes from a Yakisha background and my father more from a Hasidisha background. And after the war, um, they, you know, they met in Williamsburg, that is Shidduch. And so I think I got what was called Heimish. Mm -hmm. My father wears a strimal and so do all my brothers. I have seven brothers, but each one of us has a kind of our own little flavor. So mm -hmm. I wasn't really raised with a Rebbe per se. Mm -hmm. But we had a hodgepodge of Hasidic influence and also just, I don't know, nice Jewish values. So that was, we actually heard the word Heimish also in my Orthodox life. So, um, you know, yeah. besides Muncie, that's another like, you know, ding, <laughs> buzz if you hear the word that uh, was um, raised and also vilified. And, you know, again, I think um, what we try to get across here is that um, there's no like monolithic experience. There's no monolithic Muncie experience. There's no monolithic Heimish experience. Um, there can be room for diverse experiences and there can be room for painful experiences and positive experiences. And I think, you know, really what we are trying to push back at is sort of this notion that we see again and again, that the only option that we hear about is the negative and the, you know, um, vilified and, never about kids like, you know, playing in the woods and playing with dolls and, and having fun and coming from, you know, loving families and, um, and leaning into their Judaism. Um, another thing that we heard um, on this show on other shows, and again, is the reality for some people, but not your, you know, Hasidic or Heimish reality was that the, uh, there's no education uh, for women. Um, and you're a therapist. So if Ridiculous. you could let us know. Yeah. So <laughs> what what was your education like? And when, how, why did you uh, get interested in mental health? Okay, well, um, 
a lot of people ask me this one. Um, I went to a school in Muncie called Base Ruckel. Um, the academics were amazing. Uh, we learned Hebrew subjects in the morning. Uh, uh, biblical studies were translated into Yiddish and then we all knew English. So basically I was learning in three languages. And then in the afternoon, we had a pretty intensive English curriculum. As a matter of fact, when I got to NYU, which is one of the top two social work schools in the country, I, was, uh, I felt like slightly bored when all mm. the people in my class were complaining about having to quote 12 sources for a paper and writing an eight page paper. I was like, I don't know why grown adult women and men are complaining about this. I did this my entire life. Hmm. We learned the commentaries. We had to translate them. We, I, I, I was like, wow, I didn't realize what an amazing education I had. Hmm. So, um, that's and just, just to put this onto the map in terms of where base Rachel falls out hushkafically sort of in the, the frame of Orthodox uh, communities. Is this um, a base Yaakov? Is this um, in the Haimish world? Is it Hasidim? Who, Haimish. Who's it attracting? Haimish. Yeah, so we would have um, Yeshima, Yeshivish, Haimish, Hasidish. All mixed um, together. It's, it's a mix and it's a community-based school, but doesn't identify with a Hasidic sect at all. Mm-hmm. But it's, it's not a base Yaakov. My parents wouldn't have sent me to base Yaakov. They would have thought maybe that was a little too modern. I'm not, mm-hmm. It's hard to quantify it. No, it's it's an interesting point because, again, base Yaakov came up in the show as, um, you know, a place that doesn't teach anything. And here you are at a base Rachel um, that, you know, prepared you to get into a top uh, social work school um, and feel like, um, you know, you you know, you, you have the knowledge, the background to be able to, you know, compete. So what did you, um, what motivated you to want to become a social worker? What, what's that journey about? Okay. So I think when we were uh, newly married, my husband and I did many different things, but he was learning in Kolo. He was studying Torah. And then he started working with at-risk boys, Hasidic boys that weren't fitting into the mainstream yeshiva system. And he formed like a little school for 20 or 30 kids. And each one of these children had a variety of issues. And when they needed help, there was no Yiddish speaking therapist. There was no Yiddish speaking, a Heimish person that could understand the culture. And Mm. these kids were going to therapists that really didn't get the community. And my husband turned to me and said, I was always open about, um, you know, just being an open person, the, pursuing my education at that point, having, I always like to read. So I read lots of stuff about mental health and holistic health. And he's like, why don't you go into social work? Why mm. don't you be the person you speak Yiddish? Why don't you go help these kids? There mm. are a lot of people that probably need your help. And it was something I had never thought of before. I'd never gone to college because that wasn't in the framework of how I grew up. Mm -hmm. Um, More women I knew were teachers, nurses, librarians, business owners. College was not something in the Hasidic community where I grew up that was sort of accepted. Mm -hmm. But, you know, when I talked to my parents and I explained it to them, it was sort of when I learned how to drive and they were like, well, why would you need to know how to drive? It's just something that wasn't People Done. didn't do in my community back then. And now three quarters of Muncie drives, maybe not the real, real Hasidic people like in New Square and Satmar, but all of my friends drive. And so this was like, okay, as long as you do it with the rabbi's um, guidance. You know, guidance, it's fine. And I did Empire State College for my bachelor's. Um, that's a funny one. And my mentor was actually like, why are you settling for social work? Why don't you become a psychologist? And my goal was like, do the fastest way possible so I can help my community. And I always knew I would continue training. So while I was still finishing up my bachelor's, I applied to NYU and Columbia. And I made the decision to go to NYU as more clinical. And um, I didn't look back. And 20 years later, I'm a registered play therapy supervisor. I'm an EMDR consultant. 
I'm uh, the trauma coordinator of the Trauma Recovery Network for uh, EMDR in our mm. community, where we offer pro bono services in case of hate crimes, terrorism, and natural disasters. So I am a real resource. I'm one of the beginner, beginner Heimish Hasidish people that decided to pursue higher education uh, with the support of my rabbi to improve the lives of those in my community. I love it. I think also just, you know, an interesting point um, that I'm noticing that I think I want to draw out is that, you know, there's a difference between um, something being less typical and parents or community being open to hearing why you want to do something less typical and, you know, making space for the person that wants to be less typical and other parents or other, you know, uh, places a person can find themselves where there is no room to do something atypical. And I think um, that can vary family to family, rabbi to rabbi, sure. school to school. And I think sure. all the difference, it's all the difference in the world. Um, you know, there's one setup where, just everybody's doing out of the box things and the person has in mind that they can do it too. There's another, you know, setup where a person is raised to even have the idea to do something out of the box or feel comfortable to discuss it and have a, a support system of saying, okay, it's not done all the time, but you know, we can work with this. It's, you know, it can be okay. And then obviously the last option where there is no room for individuality, there is no room for dreams, you know, things are just shot down you know, that, um, that exists in some places, but that exists, um, anywhere where there's dysfunction. If you take, you know, my background growing up in sort of a waspy preppy private school, there were certain careers that people, you know, were supposed to go into. And I imagine that if somebody came home and told their parent, they wanted to do something that would make no money or, you know, kind of not go down the, the family path. Um, there could also be disappointment there and, you know, kind of the child not living up to parents' expectations. And I think it's so important um, that we put, you know, these negative experiences that we see again and again in TV shows and movies um, into the, the context and the framework of different families have more and less healthy dynamics. So that's wonderful to hear that you were one of the first, um, you know, women in your community to get a master's degree um, and the way that your family uh, responded so positively. Um, and so, I guess now let's talk about the work that you do in terms of, you know, play therapy, EMDR. Um, you know, I, I think um, because we work with people that have fallen out of the Hasidic community through our, you know, Makom branch, we're seeing some of the most dysfunctional cases, some of the most traumatic cases, some of the most abusive cases. Um, something that, you know, has made me think a lot about, you know, sort of the cases that we're seeing is the role of the Holocaust on the Hasidic community. Obviously, the Holocaust had a huge role in the Jewish community at large, but the Hasidic community is nearly 100% uh, percent survivors or descendants of survivors, you know, sort of closed into a as a sort of a closed system. Is that something that you've given thought to before, kind of how the Holocaust has played into, um, you know, trauma or dysfunctional patterns in the community? Sure. I actually had a conversation with one of my clients this morning about that. It's a mom of a you know, large family and so many of the messages that um, she has growing up are really related to scarcity and mindset of like fear and mm -hmm. abandonment and the mm -hmm. world is going to go to hell and mm -hmm. um another client and child i worked with the other day we were just discussing how um this parent feels like food was always such a huge issue coming from a holocaust survivor um a background that the kids had to eat everything and now she's a mother well what if your child doesn't want to eat mm -hmm. right what you serve and how does that you may not even know how much the third generation or fourth generation right now after the Holocaust, these messages are just streaming through our DNA and impacting problems, which if you didn't have that background, you could just really be like, okay, this is an issue, let's fix it. But it's sort of in your, what we call the kishkas, like it's in, in your kishkas, gut, Spania. that you, um, you, you're just responding from a place that has no it doesn't make sense, but it's so real mm -hmm. that we, and that's why I love doing family work because when you work with a child and play therapy, you get, you're giving the child the space to the toys or their language and you're allowing them to process what's going on for them. It's open-ended, it's not directive and that's healing. Mm -hmm. However, in the world that I live in with so many children of Holocaust survivors, 
family systems, and I believe it's pretty much for everybody, everyone comes to parenting with something. Mm -hmm. And when there's an identified problem, if the family could heal together, then we not only heal the family, we not only help the child, we help the parent, we also build resilience for the future and for the following generation. So um, that's a big focus of my work. I love it. It's so important. Um, I think, um, you know, in terms of insularity or trying to, you know, keep a healthy distance from the latest things happening in society, there's sort of this tension with more, um, you know, right-wing Orthodox communities that there's a lot of unhealthy things going on in the secular world. And rightly so, um, there is an interest to keep, um, put up walls at the same time when there are positive developments when it comes to things like mental health, um, you know, the community can be slower to respond, slower to, um, you know, kind of get over the stigma. I mean, to be honest, every community has had stigmas around mental health and not normalizing these conversations. And I think, you know, talking to insiders, um, even happy insiders, there's just a reality that, you know, the Hasidic community will be slower to get to an issue um, to sort of get it through. So where would you say um, the Hasidic community is today? At least at least the community that you see, because I just made my rule before there's no monolithic Hasidic community, but sort right. of in, in the circles that you swim in, where would you say um, sort of mental health awareness um, is right now? So because I speak Yiddish fluently, I would say that 90% of my clients are Yiddish speaking Hasidic people. I see a lot of boys for sure, because their natural first language is Yiddish and they don't learn English till they're a little older. So I really have a good inside view into what's going on. I think um, the Hasidic community in my neighborhood, Muncie New Square, Monroe, that area has really made tremendous gains in accessing mm -hmm. mental health. I almost have a little joke that we have more therapists than any other zip code in the country because it's a new, um, so many girls and men are going to um, a graduate school for social work, for nursing, for special education, because there's a new framework for providing higher education while maintaining separate uh, gender classrooms. Mm -hmm. So we have a lot of people going into the field of social work and uh, parents, school principals, pediatricians are really recommending therapy as a uh, literally, this is the first step you want to do when your kid has a problem. And I'm mm -hmm. not saying it because I'm on the show with you. Right, right. This is actually what's happening. And sometimes I'll get a child that has a little anxiety. And I have to say to the mother, look, your child's not yet six years old. I think we should do parenting mm -hmm. and let the kid go play outside. Right. Let, mm. So you don't have to bring the kid to therapy. You know, you need therapy. Right. Primary influence. Right. Mm -hmm. And then there's a boy or a girl that's 10 years old, eight years old, 12 years old, 14 years old. And there's something going on. Like you said, not everything is rosy. My grandmother right. used to say, there's always a few rotten apples in a barrel of apples. Mm -hmm. And I always used to wonder, well, why was she saying that when I was young? And now I find that it's a great way to view the world, whether you're um, in the secular community, whether you're in, uh, we live side by side with a huge Haitian community. So I work with a lot of Haitian children uh, hmm. in my 18 years of part-time work at a clinic here. And our issues are the same, believe it or the not. Issues are the same, every I know. Mom, every dad wants the best for their children. When a kid is acting out, a mom and dad wants help. But right. we have all made progress. And I think for me, I think there's such a huge awareness right now and dysfunctional families definitely exist yeah. and they need help. And uh, what I like to say is the nature of family is dysfunction. The question is how much when you put a lot of people together, you're going to have some sort of dysfunction. Right. Being in the sentence. It's true. You know, and even, um, you know, Obviously, there are stories, some of the you know stories we hear the most are sort of stories of, of sex abuse in the Orthodox mm -hmm. world. And so it's obviously deeply concerning. You know, a lot of people that we see at Makom um, are survivors of this. At the same time, I look at 
the secular world is not doing so great with, you know, the Me Too movement, all of these different institutions protecting their own, U.S. gymnastics protecting their own. I think the difference is that um, we expect a religious Jew to do better. Um, yes. And I think sometimes people will use halacha, will use Jewish law to kind of find ways to protect the abuser. Um, so do you see, I guess, improvements in terms of educating kids to know about their bodies, to speak up sort of just more of an awareness that bad guys need to be put away? Like what type of, you know, sort of progress have you seen in that space? Yes. Yeah, so I'm actually a specialist in dealing with sexual abuse. So mm -hmm. um, I, we did a podcast. I did an Instagram live with Joma last week on personal Amazing. safety because there was a huge issue that came out in the Jewish community. Yeah. I don't want to get into the specifics, yeah, yeah. but parents were frantic. Mm -hmm. And I am called upon for that. Amudin is a great organization that deals with sexual abuse. I think when parents come in, there's a sexual abuse, abuse issue. I, um, I do report if I need to. Um, you know, the law is very clear. I'm a mandated reporter. I have yeah. my rabbis backing. I, I have his guidance. I practice within the scope of mm -hmm. the way I live. And I really support moms on taking any abuse to court. And really, you know, you have to work with the child. You have to maintain safety, right? Yep. And uh, there's always a story in the sexual abuse. Um, it, it's horrible. It's horrific. Yep. And, but I do find parents coming in and saying, look, I was sexually abused. I'm worried about my kid. What yeah. can I do? How can I educate them to prevent this from happening? Because the statistics are bad all over the world. Right. And we can always do better uh, in the Jewish community. But we're, we're making headway. 100%. Yeah, I sort of feel like um, there will always be creeps and manipulators and bad people that will try to get through. Yeah. I think really as a community, what we need to do is create checks and balances to make sure they don't have positions of power, they don't have access to children. So we empower our children with knowledge and we have systems of checks and balances to make sure they can't weasel their way through because, um, you know, if you look at U.S. gymnastics to go back to that, there was a doctor that was, you know, uh, sexually abusing the, their top athletes for years and years and they gave yeah. him cover. And, you know, now U.S. Gymnastics is doing, you know, this big project to um, give parents uh, the sound, you know, the the sound of mind that um, they're revamping their clubs. They're looking at how to make things safer. They're having um, accountability. And I think, um, I mean, those are the things in sort of sort of systemic positive changes. You know, obviously people like you that are working on the ground uh, one by one are tremendous educating, you know, helping uh, to put the bad guys away, but also sort of like, you know, I'm thinking a lot, how do we create these changes so that just parents everywhere can, um, you know, can learn about how to keep their kids safe at schools everywhere can have these types of curriculum. Do you think that we're, you know, getting to a point where it will become, um, you know, commonplace that every, you know, Orthodox, ultra Orthodox Hasidic school would have some sort of basic curriculum for the kids to learn how to be safe? I think it needs to be done in a way that understands the culture of the community. So whether it's a Hasidic community or any community all over the world, and I speak to parents that are non-Jewish on Instagram all the time and on Facebook, on LinkedIn. And one of the things is that parents are uncomfortable talking to their kids about the topic of sexuality. They're uncomfortable talking to their kids about the names of private parts. They're uncomfortable talking in therapy themselves. Now, now we want to set them up to uh, talk to their kids on every age and stage developmentally, they're lost. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a worldwide issue. And mm -hmm. what we need to do, what I've done with the community that I work with, and I think it could slowly be done, is to really say, you don't need to use private parts language if you don't feel comfortable with that. But you need to give your children language, period. So mm -hmm, private mm -hmm. parts, for example, mm -hmm, right? Let people be comfortable in talking to their children in a way that their children have language. So when something happens or someone says something, they can come back home and say, mommy, so-and-so said they wanted to touch my private parts, but you told me that no one is allowed to do that, right? Mm -hmm. Or I actually, unfortunately, had to talk to my girls when they were four and six someone in my neighborhood was found to be a molester. Oh, and I had to really talk to my girls and say, look, 
I had no information. I wasn't a therapist at that point. Mm -hmm. I was just another mother. And I said to them, look, girls, there are places in your body that get covered. That's where your underwear and your undershirt go. No one's allowed to touch you there. And there are crazy people who like touching kids in these kind of places where they go to the bathroom. Did that man ever do that to you? Hmm. And they both looked at me like I was nuts. <laughs> and then as teenagers, each one separately came over to me and said, Ma, whatever happened to that nutty buddy? Right. right? Like, did he ever hmm. go to jail? We hmm. remember you talking to us about it. So it can be done and it should be done in a way yeah. that's culturally appropriate wherever you're from, whether you're Hasidic, modern Orthodox, anywhere, there there is a way forward to get comfortable. And and my focus is more in the home because if we can reach the people, we don't have to worry about the systems, Mm -hmm, right? mm -hmm. And I think that more and more parents want that information and we can go one school at a time, one rabbi at a time, but if we get the information like we're doing right now, right, into the hands of the people, yeah. then we, we give them the inspiration they need to do what's right for their kids. We also empower them with the knowledge to be able yes. to make these decisions. Yes. Amazing. Um, so glad that you're out there. So glad that you're doing this. Um, so glad that you've been doing this for so many years. Um, so glad that uh, there's, you know, more uh, attention and awareness and less stigma than ever. Um, and, you know, we wish you continued Hatzlacha. Um, thank you for not only your service, but also just providing another um, look into the life of a Hasidic Haimish woman um, in Muncie, um, healing people and, um, you know, creating healthy families. So uh, thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. And thank you so much for joining us. You can catch us same time, same place next week. Bye-bye.